With great pleasure, I welcome you here in uh, the West Indies House and, um, for tonight's lecture with Larry Ziedentop. My name is Monique Knappen, and as director of the John Adams Institute and your host of tonight's evening, I'm, I was a little bit afraid that we could, couldn't start on time, but it seems to be rather okay. Must be some people you know, still stuck in the traffic because it's rather horrible today, so I'm happy you made it all. Um, another thing I have to um, tell you, I'm afraid, is that Oscar Gaskar is um, excused tonight. He couldn't come and he regrets it very much, but we're very happy and fortunate that we found, I think, a very good replacement in, uh, in Juri Albrecht. Mr. Albrecht is uh, writing for uh, Vrij Nederland the magazine, and apart from being an historian, he studied European politics in Oxford and even thought there uh, on European issues. For those who, of you who don't know about the John Adams Institute, we organize lectures with American authors and speakers on various topics. We are an independent and non-profit organization and with a small staff and a large number of volunteers, we try to bring the best of America to you. There are, there are various possibilities to support us and if you wish, you can find information just outside the, informa uh, just outside the hall. Larry Ziedentop, our guest of tonight, wrote Democracy in Europe, and apart from giving us theoretical, theoretical insight on the subject, it is most of all an outcry for debate and discussion on how Europe should move on. Mr. Ziedentop will talk about his book, and we are very pleased he will share his thoughts on the relations between U the US and Europe after the recent terrorist attacks and the war in, Af in Afghanistan. Before we really start, I would like to thank Penguin Books, Benelux, and Rick Amado, the Information Office of the European Parliament in The Hague, and the Foreign Affairs Department of the City of Government. Sorry, City of Amsterdam, sorry. Thanks to the last two parties, we were able to offer you a reception immediately following this lecture. His Excellency Reed Fendrick, Charge d'Affaires, of the United States of, of, uh, Embassy in The Hague will invite you, all of you, after the formal program. Tonight's moderator, Yuri Albrecht, will in a moment introduce Mr. Ziedentop, after which he will speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. By the way, Mr. Ziedentop is American. Don't be misled by his British accent. After the lecture, Yuri will start off the discussion and will give you, at a certain moment, a chance to raise questions. If necessary, you can use the microphones in the aisles. There will be no intermission, and uh, please do not smoke and switch off your mobile phones. Thank you very much, and Yuri, please come forward. Yes, um, I've been asked to say a few things about Larry Ziedentop as an introduction to his lecture tonight, which is a pleasure and an honor for me because um, the book, um, which is actually um, this book, Democracy in Europe, is a good read, a very good read. And not only that, it's a very important and interesting book. But let me first say something about uh, Larry Ziedentop. He's 65 years old. He was born in Chicago, raised partly in New England. He went to Harvard and he went to Oxford after that um, to Magdalen College. Magdalen College is one of the nicest, most beautiful colleges in Oxford. If you talk about the dreaming spires of Oxford, you talk about Magdalen College. It has a beautiful, beautiful meadow, um, huge, big old trees, and it's one of the few places in England where you have the, the kivitz bloom, which is the snake head in English, um, flowering, and, and it's a beautiful kleine uh, lily, little lily, which is out there in the meadows. And um, I used to live opposite it in a modern building and looking out on that meadow in a very horrible sort of Belmomere flat. Um, it, it must have been a uh, remarkable uh, surroundings in those, those times, uh, the 60s, when England was still a class society for America to come. I can't imagine uh, how impressive that must have been. Um, Larry Ziedentop, uh, Ziedentop um, stuck, stuck around. He stayed in Oxford, actually. In 1973, he, became, he went away for a little while, but 
more or less, he, he stayed there. In 1973, he became a faculty lecturer on political thought, and he uh, is that still now. He is a fellow of Keeble College. Keeble uh, College is one of the later colleges, um, but is a uh, it has a very forbidding old structure as well. Um, a bit of like the Rijksmuseum here in Amsterdam. Um, he writes Larry's Edentop for the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, the Times, the Financial Times. He comments, he's a commenter. He's a commenter in the best way um, there is actually of an independent academic who writes his opinions in, um, in the media and debate and takes part in the public debate in that way. But he also, of course, he writes academic books, The Nature of Political Theory. He's an editor of that. It's an authoritative book. Um, and he's a specialist in liberal thought, specialist um, uh, French liberal thought, English liberal thought. Um, that has a, it's a very strong tradition in, in Oxford. Um, think of the late Isaiah Berlin, his four essays on liberty. It's a beautiful tradition in Oxford of um, people elaborating thinking and being specialist in, well, the, the, the liberal 20th century thought, political thought. Um, in 1994, his uh, study on Alexis de Tocqueville appeared. Um, and I think um, it's very, very telling that um, he's commenting on de Tocqueville, of course, with his title of the book, Democracy in Europe. In 1832, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote a book, De la démocratie en Amérique, 18, did, did I say 19? Yes, of course, 18. <coughs> 32, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy that the, the, the public is awake. <laughs> um, and it's, it's very telling that it, there, was a, there was a French marquis who went to America to describe the democracy in, in, um, and to be enthusiastic about democracy and describe what's happening in, in this new democracy in America. And now it's funny that this Oxford Don, this American, comes to Europe and I think an Oxford Don is the closest we get in the early 21st century to something like a marquee. Um, and he is, <laughs> he is actually um, uh, telling us about our democracy. And, um, and that's what he's doing in his new book. Very concise, and I would say um, very important book. Because um, it's, it's read by the European leadership. Uh, I, it has its influence. I think it had already its influence in um, the speech Joska Fischer made about the future of Europe. It was very obvious if you read that speech that he read actually Larry Zedentop's book. Um, and what's also very nice about it is that in the best Oxford tradition, like A.G.P. Taylor or something, it's very well written. Has no, but it's also provocative. Let me just the table of contents has things like titles in the of, of chapters. How Britain has lost its voice. That's, you know, that's immediately you, you, it's starting a debate. Britain lost its voice? Come on, it's not true. It's, it's <laughs> um, why constitutions are important. Also in England, in England especially, very pro provocative thing to say, but I would say even in the European Union, a lot of people don't want the European Union to have a constitution. Or creating an open political class. Th this, is, this is a pamphlet, and that's what's so good about it. It's a cry to arms to journalists, to politicians, to intellectuals, to have a debate on Europe. And um, it's about time, I would say, um, that somebody does it. It describes, it's, it's also a worrying book, which describes the deep rift between um, the elites and the people. And it describes the lack of, of debate. So it's a call to arms to ask basically probably everybody here in the, in the audience. Um, because Seedentop describes that, um, um, he, he writes such sentences as, increasingly we find ourselves worshipping at the altar of economic growth rather than citizenship. And it's, that's what the book is about. The book is a call to arms to citizenship. We, all the citizens in Europe, should awake and um, tell the politicians that we want this, that we want that, that we have rights, that we um, are not that we are not content with, with these issues, or we want different things. And in a way, I would say this book is a new is a worthy um, follow-up to Julian Banda's book of the 1930s, Le Trésor de Clerc. Um, it's, um, it's telling, actually, if I were a politician and I read it, I would be very worried, because he's saying that they're not doing their job, that they're not doing what they're paid for, that they um, should think about where this new European Union is going. 
and um, that's, but he, he doesn't let us off the hook, um, he doesn't let you off the hook. Um, we, the sh citizens, should do it as well. And that's why I, I, I mean, it's very informed, uh, it's very academic, and it's also a good read, and it's also a, a, a call to arms. So it's those three things, and that's why it's nice, and that's why it's very nice also to have Mr. Siedentop here tonight speaking about uh, the European Union, because there is, of course, a lot going on here in Europe. And I will um, stop at this point and give him the floor, and we will have uh, a little bit of a talk after it, and you are able to join in as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming. I'm sorry about the accent as it's developed. Um, most Americans don't know that Bob Hope is English. I said to Monica, in a rather lame defense of myself. I want to talk about the book, the arguments in the book, and look at them in the second half of the talk uh, in the light of uh, events since September 11th. We are all Americans now. That phrase, which I'm sure will enter history, um, showed the extraordinary European response to the events of September 11th, uh, a response that included even the French, whose uh, semi-official uh, American skepticism dropped away very quickly uh, in the event. That genuine, immediate, widespread response seems to me impor important. Important especially because it does raise the, the question of do we share a common enterprise? Do we have the same purposes, finally? And if so, what are they? And that's the larger, those are the larger questions that uh, hang over what I want to say this evening. So I'll do it, as I said, by two steps. First, discussing the book and the arguments in the book, and then um, reviewing them in the light of recent events. So let's begin with democracy in Europe. I wrote the book really because I became more and more perplexed and astonished by the contrast between the range, depth, and quality of argument which attended the formation of the United States uh, uh, surrounding the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and what seemed to me the lack of basic probing discussion in Europe about the extraordinary developments in Europe, especially since the late 1980s and the acceleration of integration. It seemed extraordinary not least because, after all, European states far older than the American colonies were uh, when they was difficulty uh, combined. And uh, our states with long, proud traditions, with, a, with their own political cultures, and the failure to address the basic questions, I suppose, is what uh, drove me to spend nearly two years writing this book. The absence of such a great debate across Europe seems to me to argue not just a democratic deficit in Europe, but also a kind of crisis of legitimacy, a crisis of legitimacy which I think one can see affecting the central institutions of the European Union at the moment. The acceleration of integration since the late, late 1980s was, it seems to me, in, to an important extent, the French response to German reunification. 
And France has undoubtedly been, in my view, the motive force of European integration, has set the pace, has had the vision on the whole, and uh, as you shall see as the argument develops, you know, the, the, this carries with it, in a sense, the, both the advantages and the disadvantages of French political culture and the French state system. The question which was being begged, it seemed to me, has been begged since the late 1980s is essentially, what is the nature of the political project for Europe? What are the implications of these series of treaties for the nation states of Europe? What is the final form of Europe going to be? What is the road? Where are we on it? How does enlargement fit into that picture? What debate there has been seems to me to have been rather unsatisfactory and polarized. On the one hand, those urging further integration have on the whole fallen back on economic arguments, uh, arguments about the advantages of getting richer together, not perhaps very controversial. Opponents, on the other hand, have fallen back on the defense of national sovereignty, on an essentially legal category, which is also perhaps rather sterile. That polarized debate seems to me to miss what is surely the central issue facing Europe. That is, what is the future of self-government in Europe? What are the conditions of self-government in a democratic society on a continental scale? Now, it's, ex it's that question or that those questions which seem to me to make American experience interesting and potentially uh, instructive for Europe. I'm not at all urging slavish imitation, but there are things to be learned, and not just from the formal federal system. I mean, American federalism was not created as I say in the book, ex nihilo, and it's not like Jehovah's create, creation suddenly created in Philadelphia out of nothing. It rested on antecedent practices and habits. And it seems to me any adequate examination of the uh, prospects of and the problems facing European integration and the construction of a new political system in Europe must consider not just the formal features of a, anything like America, uh, an American federal system, that is checks and uh, the separation of powers, checks and balances, a new role for the courts, judicial review, and so forth. Not just these formal features or discoveries of American federalism, as Tocqueville called them, but also the informal conditions which made possible its success. And so I spent part of the book looking at some of those informal uh, conditions which, it seems to me, uh, made possible the success of American federalism. The first uh, condition is one that I think Europe can't match, and that is, of course, that these American colonies had the recollection of a common subordination. They'd been subject to the British crown, and there's a sense in which the delegates at Philadelphia were aware of the ghost of the old imperial constitution and thought they were, in creating a federal government, uh, recreating what had existed before to some extent. I suppose the only, I mean, the nearest Europe can get the, to that is German occupation for a number of years in the 1940s, but that perhaps is a, a, a recollection better left to one side. This, the other informal conditions which are, uh, I discussed in the book are, first of all, the strong tradition and habit of local self-government. And here I think, you know, changes in European states, France, Italy, Spain, even finally the United Kingdom in a rather ill-assorted and incomplete way, um, the reconstruction of European states has been going on apace. And I think, in a sense, 
with a view to devolution, to increasing local and regional autonomy. And that change, that pattern of change, I think is rather encouraging. A third informal factor, of course, was common language. And here again, although at first glance this might seem rather a serious obstacle to anything like a, a single political system across Europe, uh, it seems to me that uh, the de facto role of English in Europe now makes this uh, not such a, uh, such a problem. Um, and even, I think, the French, especially French civil society, which often takes great pleasure in moving in an opposite direction from the French state and the French political class. Um, I think you know, French business, French commerce, French civil society has, uh, in effect, accepted uh, this role for English. So another informal condition I discuss is an open political class uh, dominated by lawyers, which seems to be inescapable in any complex political system where conflicts of jurisdiction loom large. And the, the relatively practical suggestion I make in the book in connection with creating such an open political class in Europe is that uh, and I say it with no pleasure, but it seems to me in a way the European Parliament has not been an unmitigated success. And you could even argue that it's helped to disconnect Euro the national political classes from the European project, which has become a major problem for Europe, I think. And I suggest that a, a European Senate uh, consisting, of, I mean, a small uh, upper house consisting of leading members of national parliaments with a, a, a fairly limited agenda, central to which, in my view, ought to be uh, uh, giving subsidiarity teeth, uh, limiting centralization in Europe, um, that such a Senate m might help to begin to reintegrate national political classes with the European project. And lastly, the uh, another informal condition I discuss is what one might call shared moral beliefs. Um, shared attitudes about the role of the state on the one hand and what should be left to individuals on the other. And I noticed in passing that one of the extraordinary things that's been noticed ever since Tocqueville, uh, at least, that uh, you know, you, you, about the American scene is the way in which Christianity is given a liberal interpretation in the United States as authorizing equal liberty, and in a sense, it's the site of a religion imposing limits on its own role. And uh, I think for Europe, the diff the, uh, an important difference remains a, an anti-clerical tradition, a suspicion of a monolithic church, which in a sense the United States never experienced, uh, and which poses perhaps something of a uh, of a problem in that area. Well, how, why has this great debate in Europe not developed? Why this extraordinary contrast between the range and depth of debate in the United States in the late 1780s and recently in Europe? Well, a number of things. First, obviously, the circumstances of early post-war Europe which meant that idealism was focused on the prevention of further war and protecting Western Europe from uh, the Soviet Union, from Soviet power, and uh, the concerns about constitutionalism were, in a sense, uh, perhaps seen as luxurious, and, and uh, no doubt also the fact that Germany was, still a, was then a pariah state would have made projects for political union uh, more or less unthinkable. Secondly, I think the very success of the European Union and economic integration, the unprecedented prosperity of post-war Europe, uh, which created a, gradually a kind of zeitgeist uh, and contributed to what in my book I describe as the fallacy of economism. That is, the habit uh, increasingly of subordinating political and especially constitutional argument to economic argument, a political or constitutional agenda to an economic agenda. Uh, I, it's a fallacy, it seems to me, because for this reason, that you know, economic behavior 
can be modified in re relatively short order through taxation, advertising, uh, other incentives. Economic behavior can be modified relatively quickly. But political attitudes and habits, and particularly, I would argue, the attitudes and habits of a free people, of a self-governing people, can be created only very slowly. And not only can they be created only very slowly, there's a further unpleasant twist, and that is, it seems to me, they can be lost far more quickly than they can be, uh, they can be gained. Uh, and that's an asymmetry which I think those creating Europe ought constantly to bear in mind. Still another factor, I think, which helps to explain the lack of a great debate in Europe is what I, in the book, call a kind of veiled competition between three forms of the state to, become, to provide the model for Europe as a whole. And those are uh, the French, the German, and the British. I, it seems to me that the French model, which traditionally was a radically centralized and bureaucratic uh, model of the state, uh, despite recent decentralization, uh, remains uh, in a, a state machine, a state system, which in a sense is very good at delivering the goods. Once state policy is focused on some policy, whether it's the creation of TGVs or nuclear power stations, it, a kind of rational decision-making process takes over and uh, obstacles are uh, circumvented or pushed aside. So, power is the name of the game, in a sense, in France. In sharp contrast to Germany and its federal system, where named up partly uh, in imitation of the United States and partly drawing on older German confederation, the formal dispersal of authority and power is the key. Britain provides, uh, well, you know, it's a phrase which is politically incorrect, so I won't use it, uh, but uh, Britain provides the, the turning of the screw in a way, because Britain with its unwritten constitution, with its common law constitution, uh, has pretty consistently opposed anything like a federal, i.e. German, uh, outcome for, you, for Europe. Um, and yet, Britain can't export its own constitution. It's too idiosyncratic. It's too tied to a particular social structure, to a particular social order. Uh, so federalism uh, has been opposed. Britain is unable to uh, export its own system. What remains? It's the French model. And I think that is one of the reasons, though by no means the only reason, why France is such a, has had such a central and, for the most part, creative role in uh, the development of the European Union. But the underside of that French role and that French influence is, I think, you know, the political culture attached to a, bu a bureaucratic form of the state. And what I argue in Democracy in Europe is that the greatest single achievement in a way of American federalism is that this combination of formal and informal conditions gradually created a culture of consent, a kind of willingness to suspend disbelief in the law based on a con conviction that the law could be changed if it didn't adequately reflect popular will. I think the, con the contrast between that, such a culture of consent and a culture of suspicion or cynicism is you know, the, the kind of culture which, in this rather telling French phrase, which the law is usually seen or often seen as the work of and serving the interests of les autres, others. Um, that uh, contrast between the culture of consent on the one hand and the culture of suspicion or cynicism on the other is something, again, that I think uh, those who are creating Europe and pushing European integration ought to bear in mind. <clears throat> Jumping across the Atlantic, just to su suggest that uh, uh, you know, there are problems on both sides, uh, I spend a chapter looking at 
what seems to me the, in a way, the most interesting and important development in the American political system in, the, in recent decades, and that is the shift of population, wealth and influence, south and west, and what one might call the decline of the old northeastern establishment. Uh, that establishment which survived its time in, 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 in a way, it, uh, survived an extraordinarily long time, uh, I think largely through the influence of Northeastern universities and law schools who took Americans from all over the, the United States and uh, imbued them, if you like, with the values of liberal democracy. Um, I think that dominance of the Northeast has begun to give way in recent decades. And it does raise the question of you know, the perhaps increasing role of uh, a more populist political culture in the United States. It seems a fair description of the difference between the political cultures of the South and the Southwest uh, compared to that of uh, the old Northeast. Uh, it's a political culture, you know, it's been associated with distrust of Washington, of the political class, uh, anti with anti-intellectualism, and of course with uh, fundamentalist religion. And yet, it's interesting, I think, you know, the extent to which American constitutionalism has contained that development at least up to a point. Uh, a few examples spring to mind. Uh, the way Clinton's misbehavior didn't lead in the country to a groundswell of support for his um, resignation. I mean, on the constitutional provisions, I think, on the, uh, on the whole prevailed, and it was thought that his uh, behavior hadn't uh, really met the constitutional test which uh, required him to go. I was also struck last autumn by, at the time of um, the election of President, President Bush, um, by the reaction in many European countries that uh, to uh, an, a, a president being elected without, with perhaps less than a popular majority, with an opponent who uh, had more popular votes nationwide. Uh, it's very interesting, I think, how Americans, by and large, I mean, of course, there was a, a minority protesting, um, were less, much less bothered by that outcome, I think. I think one of the disciplines of a fe anything like a federal system is that it leads to the recognition that it's, it's in certain circumstances, um, a territorial principle will constrain a population principle. And I think for Europeans coming out of unitary states and the political cultures associated with unitary states, that's much more disturbing. And yet it's arguably something that Europeans are going to have to take on board if um, they construct uh, anything approaching uh, a federal system in due course. And you know, long-standing, of course, the role of the courts and judges uh, in judicial review in uh, even if it's at a discrete distance from uh, developments like McCarthyism, gradually reasserting um, constitutional norms and in particular the Bill of Rights. And so working, so to speak, on behalf of liberal democracy as against populist democracy. Now all of that, I think, even in the face of this, this populist trend in the United States with the growing importance of the South and West, uh, reveals the extent to which a, a federal constitution can carry liberal democratic values and educate and help to socialize a people into uh, those va values. And I think one of the most interesting things about the United Kingdom at the moment is the way its own, I mean, the, one of the reasons, if not the chief reason, why Britain's uh, contribution to the construction of Europe has been so equivocal is that Britain is in the midst of its own constitutional crisis. And the old unwritten constitution is incapable of carrying liberal democratic values to the country at large. 
It, was, it worked very well for uh, a relatively restricted, more or less aristocratic political class. But it doesn't work for the country as a whole, which is why uh, I think the government has finally been forced into something like constitutional reform. Now, one of the ways in which a federal system helps in socializing and, and educating is, I think, uh, manifest in the way Germany probably has less, with its federal system, less problem in looking, for, looking towards the future development of the European Union than perhaps any other European country. It's adding another layer of government. It's not, uh, as so to speak, a, a, a total revolution. So my conclusion in the talk is in Europe is that federalism is the right goal for Europe, or something like federalism. Uh, that is, engaging with federalism is the only way in which Europe, I think, is going to uh, find its own distinctive political system, which may well be something which is neither confederation on, the, on an older model uh, nor American federalism, but perhaps contains features of each. Now, let me turn to uh, September, the September 11th, uh, recent events and reflections I have in relation to the arguments of the book. First, let me be a bit gloomy and uh, talk about my negative re reflections. The first is on both sides of the Atlantic, possible threat to civil liberties call, linked to this crisis. Uh, a psychological balance between constraint and consent shifts, I think, in the face of this kind of uh, international emergency and this kind of threat. Uh, and it's as if people almost welcome constraint in the circumstances. The second thing that uh, strikes me is that it's, a, it's an unfav frankly an unfavorable backdrop, an unfavorable background to Europe's developing a great debate about its constitutional future. Why? Because when you know, there is a threat to security, when there is a, a background of war or international crisis, executive power tends to benefit. And many of the constitutional safeguards embodied, say, in American federalism, as I said, the separation of powers, checks and balances, and so forth, begin to look rather fiddling, <laughs> begin to look uh, expendable. And uh, that, I think, is rather unfortunate, given, given the timing, uh, the, the invitation coming from Nice for to the member states to embark on this uh, great debate and you know, in the run-up to the next intergovernmental meeting. Um, so that, I think, is unfortunate, that constitutional precautions begin to look like what Dr. Johnson, you know, the author of the original English dictionary, called frippery. Third, uh, slightly gloomy reflection is that I think the, the chief actors in this kind of international crisis uh, obviously feel impatience with multilateralism, with any slow, cumbersome, collective decision-making uh, procedure, and in, a prefer and in a sense fall back almost instinctively on a single, clear chain of command and prefer it. And uh, that, of course, uh, is not a recipe for enhanced international cooperation. It makes one wonder even about the name of the so-called rapid reaction force. And uh, it's striking, I think, to even the extent to which NATO has been rather sidelined since September 11th. What has happened, of course, is that the nation states have emerged as the principal actors. Fourth, reflection which begins gloomily but takes turns around the corner a bit, is 
what I suppose will quickly become a cliche, so called loss of American innocence. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I can see an argument that it might be a good thing if it means that the United States becomes more sensitive to international opinion, to the plights of other uh, nations, uh, and that its you know, foreign military policies might be adjusted uh, in the light of this heightened sensitivity. But still, I must say, on balance, I'm inclined to think this loss of innocence is a bad thing. One of the extraordinary th roles of the United States, I think, for now for more than two centuries, has been to present, especially to Europeans, you know, the image of an unthreatened society, a society which is not besieged, which is not subject to many of the uh, threats uh, and stresses uh, only too f familiar in continental Europe. And I think that has helped to give you know, the United States and the image of America a powerful hold over the world's imagination so that it isn't just American, me American media uh, re responsible for that hold, but I think it is actually that site of a society where people, well, it's almost, it's, it's rather, rather, rather visual. I mean, one, even the way Americans perhaps traditionally have moved, rather free-limbed, as if not constrained by space or vexations known to other peoples. Um, that you know, freedom of, of movement, that f f limb, free limbered uh, uh, style, I think has, has been very important and very encouraging for the world at large as an alternative to what is known in many other areas. So let me now turn to what seem to me, well, more positive reflections. And the first is this. Even at the worst moments, when in many countries, and in some, uh, no doubt, in, in some religions more than others, you know, the United States is seen as great Satan, as misusing enormous military power and economic strength, I think it's also striking how you know, there is an alternative image all, always attached which, and, and uh, if you look at Iran, and one, one reads about the development of opinion in Iran recently, you know, that image of Uncle Sam and of uh, American fashions, American freedom, uh, always acts as a countervailing force, I think, and helps to offset the uh, sometimes more sinister image. Uh, I perhaps rather naughtily in the book, suggests that you, know, you can tell in a much more, of course, subtler and much more refined way. You can see something that's patterned in France, the way you know, the French public you know, snap up American fashions and are fascinated by the United States to the dismay of the French political class quite often. It's almost like a revenge on their own political class. And you know that if you ask what are the perceptions in the world at large of you know the U.S. on the one hand and uh, the EU on the other, it seems to me that for all of the great Satan image, uh, at times, the the image of a, the United of America as this great experiment in self-government uh, remains pertinent and important, whereas I think the image of the European Union and the world at large remains primarily that of an economic bloc, perhaps with aspirations to becoming a power bloc, but the element of citizenship is uh, less prominent, I fear. A second reflection um, on the positive side, and that is you know, a great deal has been made at times, not least by the French, of course, about the ide ideological distance between uh, uh, America and, and Europe, particularly the contrast between what's sometimes called Anglo-American neoliberalism, a certain attitude towards the market, um, and a kind of continental social market. Well, one of the things that struck me most in recent uh, weeks is the way uh, American neoliberalism has sudden, almost suddenly disappeared and government intervention, government spending, um, uh, central bank intervention uh, has, suggests that uh, there's a good deal less sort of ideological constraint perhaps uh, 
than, you know, than some accounts of uh, ang Anglo-American uh, liberalism su suggest. And that the attitude of, towards the state and what the state can and should deliver in certain circumstances is perhaps not as different uh, as we have sometimes been told. Uh, indeed, one might, again, a bit wickedly, suggest that the ECB seems more tied to Anglo-American liberalism than the Federal Reserve. A third reflection. Um, what's been called the new seriousness, which has followed September 11th. And that, I think, amounts to partly a retreat from what I called economism, this tendency to subordinate political argument to economic argument. I think there is suddenly a, you know, an openness to the suggestion, to the argument that citizenship ought to balance consumerism more uh, adequately in the affairs of the European Union than it has done to date. Uh, that Europe is and ought to be in the process of doing more than creating just a larger supermarket. And that awareness, that openness, I think, uh, helps to draw attention to what is the, one of the real central political problems facing the European Union as it integrates, and that is how to combine political cultures shaped by different forms of the state how to combine them and find, and not just at the lowest uh, common denominator. Fourthly, and in a way this is what I think is most interesting and important, uh, I think there's a sense in which we have been our own worst enemies in the West, not only in Europe but in the United States as well in recent decades. Um, that we've allowed our own culture to lose its identity uh, and that we haven't been very good servants of liberal democracy in that way. Um, could be tied from those look approaching it from an academic uh, angle, might be, tie, be inclined to tie this to pretty widespread decline in the teaching and understanding of history. But the sense in which the creation of representative government, of free institutions, was a long-term, precarious, difficult enterprise, and that such institutions remain fragile. That sense of the difficulty and the fragility of free institutions uh, is as important, I think, as you know, the assertion of liberal democratic values, liberal democratic principles. And, uh, I, I don't think Western societies have, in, the, in recent decades, done very well at making clear the, the core of Western identity, really. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting that you, know, you can find fundamentalisms uh, growing up in, not just in uh, Islamic societies, but in Europe and the United States too. And, it's pretty tempting to see this as, at least to an important extent, a reaction against, as it were, the lack of values on offer, the lack of uh, political and cultural identity. I mean, the extent to which we've allowed, you know, the West to become identified with, and it, it, so, liberal democracy identified with indifference, permissiveness, yeah. secularism and materialism, uh, that is, within a sense, with lack of belief. Now, that seems to me a profoundly mistaken view. And uh, the, the truth is that uh, what we call secularism is, rests not just on uh, economic interdependence and an advanced social division of labor, as perhaps you know, uh, an, an, uh, an, uh, what I call economism uh, viewpoint would uh, lead one to expect, but rests, in fact, on shared beliefs. That you know, the belief that there is a sphere in which individuals should be free to make their own choices, that's a, and the consequent distinction between a, a public and private sphere, between the state and civil society, that actually rests on shared beliefs. It's not just a matter of a, um, the division of labor, of shared interests, and convenience. But the extent to which that's so, and 
And this seems to me one of the most tantalizing features of the world since September 11th, the extent to which this crisis has perhaps revealed the moral and religious roots of uh, Western liberal democracy. Um, that is, is, I think, you know, going to be increasingly important, at least I hope so. Liberalism, at the outset, was a vision of the conditions of human flourishing, of the way in which guaranteeing a set of basic human rights fostered not only prosperity, but moral autonomy and responsibility, providing social conditions for the self-government needed to complete a virtuous circle of self-respect. All of those things tied together, self-respect, autonomy, self-government, you know, it's that constellation of values which, is re which really provides the core of liberal democracy. And I think in our unprecedented prosperity and our inclination to subordinate political arguments to economic arguments and considerations, Western societies have not been very good at conveying that. And uh, perhaps one symptom of that is the spread of which I've got something I think which is usually very well intentioned but seems to me very muddled that is multiculturalism um, you know, there are in fact if you have liberal democratic values limits to permissible moral variety uh, variety is limited by justice by a framework of individual rights basic individual rights and the liberty of individuals is not the same as the liberty of groups but we've allowed that confusion, that ambiguity to set in. And I think uh, we're going, we are paying the price for that. Let me finish with a, a slightly more emotive and uh, visual comment. It seems to me, and I say this in a heartfelt way as an historian of political thought, Europeans and Americans have inherited a great mansion, a great liberal democratic mansion many rooms. We've been living in only a few of them. We've been living in the kitchen and the counting house and the bedroom, no doubt. But the drawing room, the library, the, the salon, they, they've been under wraps somehow. We've not been making the most of our own tradition and the contrast between the, what passes for liberal thought in recent decades, which bears all the impress of what's happened to the division of intellectual labor in, in the last hundred years, with subjects being specialized and no one, in a sense, worrying about what lies in between the subjects and, and, and losing ambition. Um, if you contrast uh, liberal and democratic thinking in the last decades with the great tradition, um, you will perhaps get some sense of what I mean by when I say we've been living in only a few rooms of this magnificent house, this mansion, and I think it's time we recolonized uh, the house. Well, I think I've said nearly everything I want to say, except for this, that uh, it does seem to me also indistinctly so far perhaps and no doubt not in the short term but there is perhaps looming um, what one might call a, a common project uh, a project which would certainly do a lot I think to bind Europe and the United States together indefinitely and that is a project to make liberal democracy safe you know, make the world safe for liberal democracy and that I suppose one shouldn't these days use the word crusade but a crusade against poverty and ignorance might actually get liberal democracy back to its, what I consider its original religious roots. Uh, something like tithing might be brought back. We might be a bit less rich, but we might gradually transfer resources to the rest of the world and uh, make uh, the security problem we're facing in due course less ominous. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you didn't um, say everything you had to say because um, 
I'm going to ask you a few questions and maybe later on the public is um, joining in as well. Let me search for my watch first. Yeah. <coughs> Good. Um, thank you very much for the, your speech. You, um, you're talking often about political elites um, and you're, um, I wonder, um, first of all, the, there isn't, of course, anything like a, a European Union political elite, but do you think that if it will succeed the European Union, that it, that it need to be built? Should there be something like it, or could we do without? Dutch are very suspicious about political elites. The word elite makes them jumpy already. But um, I wonder how do you look upon such a thing as a European Union political elite? Well, I suppose that's why, on the whole, I talked about an open political class. I saw the dangers of talking about an elite. Um, and I think one should always attach open to um, class or elite in, uh, if, if one's talking in the context of a, of a democratic society. Um, yes, I think it's indispensable. And it's indispensable because uh, it's the only way of seriously connecting national political cultures, which, which remain the focus of democratic legitimacy even now, uh, and the European project. Mm -hmm. And um, do you, you say that um, this political class should be, be brought about? You, you call upon maybe you, maybe you call upon Brussels. On, on whom do you call? How well, you know, I'm a gradualist. Um, I, I think it can be created like that. But uh, you're not a creationist. Uh, yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> but that, that that was very much in my mind when I urged. You know, the, the creation of a European Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, it does seem to me you know, that leading national parliamentary figures probably now have less contact than they had in the late 1940s and 1950s. Do, do you st still so much believe in the competence of parliamentarians? Because it's sort of um, very common to look, look down upon you know, the parliamentarians in Holland, but also, I think, yeah. in the United Kingdom and yeah. in Germany. Do you still believe that political leadership is seated in the national parliaments in, in the member states? Well... Who, whom else, maybe, but... <laughs> you know, challenges and excitement are you know, important if you're going to get the best out of any uh, representatives, out of any uh, political class. And I do think there's a sense in which the way in which, especially since the late 80s, the European project has taken off has probably, and, and given the extent to which social and economic re regulation now, uh, about 80% isn't it, comes from Brussels rather than uh, national legislatures. Uh, now, I think there is a sense in which you know, political classes may feel semi-redundant Yes. national political classes and you know irresponsibility encourages irresponsibility so they should they should have a job to do actually yes. to, but there's something like the European Council uh, members of parliament going there and that's a rather dull affair I would say so but you think that if a senate has real powers it well, will change I think if leading national politicians politicians who already have a certain stature and an audience Yes. Were, you know, to say, I don't know, Ken Clark, that notorious Euro enthusiast in, yeah. in the United Kingdom, you know, were to, were to come back at two or three monthly intervals from you know, the meeting of a Senate in, in Brussels, Strasbourg, query, um, and say, you know, this is what they're thinking of doing next, or, uh, my God, they're going to do that. Uh, I think it would draw attention in a way that I'm afraid Euro MPs uh, by and large don't do. Um, would there be also, um, because you're from Oxford, um, you describe in here also in the chapter on this open elite, you describe the ENA, the French, um, um, well it's not a real university, but school for the, 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 the people who won't go into the administration. Um, would you think that we need something like that? Would that help to create such a, a sense of a, um, to create a European Union place where the, the future political elites can meet? An interesting idea. Um, I think I'd be in favor of perhaps 
bit of competition, so two or three, <laughs> so that they don't, you know, because obviously in America, get out you, of hand. In America, you do have Yale and Harvard, and, and yes. that's part of the success, maybe, of that self-governing, yes. what you described. Yes. But we don't, we lack anything like that in Europe. But of course, the American law schools are so important for the formation yes. of the American political class, and there is no c counterpart, counterpart quite in Europe for that. No, exactly. So would you, would you suggest that maybe Brussels should start something like the university like that, or, sh or should, should the universities <coughs> fight it out between themselves? Well, I think you know, a start on this road would be for Europe to acquire, you know, rather self-consciously, a few major universities. and. Uh, I would hope Oxford and Cambridge would be among them, but the, uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, a nucleus of great world-class universities would willy-nilly nilly contribute to the emergence of such a class. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So there's, that's that's maybe a good project for for Russell. Did you did you actually address this book towards such a, such a class? Your democracy in Europe. Not primarily. I think I, want, I addressed it to, I tried to create citizen discontent, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, but did you get any reactions? Let, let me rephrase that question. Did you get any reactions from, um, from maybe from, from the political class on your, because, you, because it, is, it, is, it should be quite worrying for politicians to actually read it, but did, did you get any reaction from them? Well, as you, as you said in the introduction, um, you know, the, 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 I have this very generous message from Joschka Fischer. Oh, you did? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I suppose, I mean, I know that leading political figures in a number of the countries have been responsible for seeing that it's translated into, uh, their, into their languages. Yes. Uh, so uh, that also, I suppose, is... The, the book has been considered rather anti-French. Yes. Um, I read it. Uh, I was saying to him over dinner that uh, it's being translated into almost every European language, except to be dominated by any one country. I think I'd prefer it to be France than any other. But, uh, but I don't want that to be the case, of course. Of course. Um, but yes, I mean, but as I tried to suggest, it seems to me if you get that French, uh, the, the, the French input to that extent, you also willy-nilly get some of the disadvantages of French political culture and the French political system, and uh, you know I, I, I think the ANARC for a time, you know, were, were a little bit out of control in the late 80s and, and early 90s, and were pushing. The things from the ANARC, from the yes, yes, the ANARC. Um, uh, but it's very significant, I think, that. Uh, what many people see as a kind of malaise in the European Union at the moment, a certain drift, a certain loss of confidence, is tied very closely, I think, to the fact that for the first time since 1958, the French don't quite know what they want for Europe. And that's worrying for the European project? <coughs> well, I think it is, to the extent that you know, France has been the motive, part of the motive force. And uh, it, how, how come France has lost its sense of direction? Is it only due to 11th of September that they, that they don't have any space to move anymore, or is it, is it deeper rooted? I think it's deeper rooted. I think it's, for one thing, they gradually became aware, I mean, opinion polls across the continent over various things like not only the euro, but even membership of the European Union began to uh, look rather worrying. I mean, I think they got a sense that they had moved beyond public opinion and that the project had, it was ceasing to have you know, deep popular roots. Uh, of the kind required by its ambition. Uh, I think that began to s become clear to them, but also what had always been a, a nagging worry for the French, the prospect of enlargement. I mean, it is very hard to see how, quite how you know, their conception of a, of, a, of a fully integrated Europe and these, these great categories they throw out, like a Europe of defense and a Europe of uh, uh, foreign affairs and... Um, you know, how that will, you know, will survive uh, a European Union of perhaps 25 members. Mm -hmm. They can't manage that many, they can't manipulate that many countries. They can't well, I'm sure that the first <laughs> formula that they will fall back on is uh, a multi-speed Europe. I mean, that yes, that's... But I find, I mean, I'd be interested to see what people think about this, but I, what worries me about, you know, this idea that 
different nations can go at different speeds. First of all, there's a great ambiguity about whether all nations have to agree that some nations go ahead in a certain direction at a faster speed. Whether that prior general agreement is required or not is, is, has remained rather uh, unclear, I think. Uh, but the second is, one, if you get a certain number of countries involved in more and more closely, more, more and more closely across a wide range of uh, uh, activities, the effects of pulling others into the orbit will be very powerful. And you know, I think there is a certain risk of kind of colonies. Yes. Yeah, yeah, on the on the outskirts of the union. Um, you also described this virtuous circle of liberal democracy, and you, um, in the end, also in the book, but also in, in your speech, you, you're you're saying that we should that we should occupy the whole mansion, that we should uh, do more than they were doing now, that a uh, move away from what you might call market fundamentalism, or um, because of course we do have a fundamentalism here, which I would describe as market fundamentalism. But um, but on the other hand. Um, the market is bringing richness. Um, how, how do you suggest that we move that direction? Um, if you look at the 1989 revolution, you see the Charta 77 movement and the Solidarność movement, the citizens movement, which I think you trying to to, to describe, or um, and they withered away directly after mm -hmm. after the, the takeover. Though they they brought about the only uh, uh, revolution without bloodshed maybe in human history. And, and we had it right in front of our door. We didn't take it in. So how do you su how do you suggest or, that we actually build on those sort of citizenship or these organizations? Because we're, we are very rich. We, yes. I mean, we stay very rich, probably. Well, I think it's not implausible that partic active, that active participation and citizenship can lead to a greater willingness to make sacrifices. And uh, I was very, but not only that. I was very heartened when there was some research recently about uh, countries wh wh where there have been referenda, Switzerland, Denmark, I forget, I forget quite how widespread the research was. <laughs> but w one of the chief results of this research was to show that people who voted in these referendums and expressed an opinion felt better. <laughs> now, this is not a bad basis for expanding <laughs> citizenship. I'm looking in the audience, and I think I saw somebody trying to convey to me that you want to ask a question. That was uh, very interesting remarks about, uh, let's say, uh, there's, oh, a, there's a microphone behind you. Well, my name is Leonard Boy. I was very much interested in what you say about, let's say, the, 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 the idea of, of French, which has been lost a little bit in the Euro European Union right now because of the enlargement. Do you think that is the reason the British are much more in favor in it? now because they feel, well, maybe the chance of having a European Union without a very strong ID. Ah, there's no doubt the British have been in favor of uh, enlargement from, uh, for their own reasons. Um, but I think it's, it's not just you know, that it would perhaps break the Franco-German axis or you know, disperse power more in the Union, give Britain a, uh, a more important role in the European Union. One of the more hopeful developments in Britain, I think, is you know, the way in which comparisons with Europe and even uh, interest in constitutionalism um, is, is slowly resulting from you know, exposure to the affairs of the European Union. And I think that, you know, the, of course, what the press notices are still the high levels of uh, you know, opposition in the polls to, to uh, joining the euro. But uh, I think a kind of constitutional bewilderment has settled over the United Kingdom. And, uh, you know, and I, I think a, a sense that continental countries manage their affairs better could could be a very useful spur. So it, it works both ways, I think. It's not just British cynicism about uh, you know, increasing so as to break up the old order in Europe. Um, I think there is also a, a, a more creative interest in European affairs developing slowly. Yes, over there. <laughs> 
Now it's uh, Arno Jarstra. I didn't read your book, so that, oh, that's why I'm here. Um, so I don't, need, don't know if you address uh, my question, and if, I, if you do, then I'm sorry. Um, I'd like to back, go back to the first part of your lecture, where you, were asked, where you asked us why there's no debate about Europe. And uh, there's always a lot of debate about why there's no debate. Um, but my question is, um, you talk about Philadelphia and the Constitution of the United States. Why don't you go a couple of years earlier, the big uh, battle cry uh, in the United States was no taxation with, um, without representation, uh, which means you know we pay taxes to London, but we are not free. We can decide ourselves. So in Europe, you have the, the opposite. In Europe, we will have representation without taxation. And if you ask why there is no debate in Europe, uh, it's because the people don't care. I mean, the elite uh, cares, but the people don't care. And why do the people don't care? Because they don't, they don't pay directly to Brussels. So my question is, if you're going to introduce a system why there's direct taxation from the people in Europe um, to Brussels, then people have an interest, a stake in what happens in politics, and they might get interested, they might go voting, and then we have uh, taxation with representation. That was my question. Well, of course, it's not as if Brussels doesn't get uh, European tax payers' money. Um, but I presume what you're doing is, what you're suggesting is a higher level of taxation, with right. m might, direct taxation might uh, raise political consciousness. Um, and I dare say it would. Um, but I tried to meet that point a little bit in the, when I talked about the recollections of a common subordination in Philadelphia. Um, I mean, that was, you know, the survival of an, of an older constitutional sense, which informed the deliberations in Philadelphia, and central to that constitutional sense was, of course, uh, th that, that principle. Um, I'm not sure how you would uh, get from here to there. I mean, how, how would you suddenly spring this uh, new tax agenda onto the, the nations of Europe? Well. <laughs> That's quite simple. I mean, we do pay taxes, of course, but it is, you know, it's by the national governments, and it's very easy to have a, a direct tax uh, on things you buy or, or uh, maybe a small percentage of your income. Of course, it has to be organized, but you know, people want to know what happens with their money, and, and then they get, you know, then they are interested in, in what happens in Brussels, in the Parliament, in, in, in Strasbourg, and, and in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's uh, you don't make you don't make people happy, you don't make people happy, but you you make you make them interested. I mean, it's, it's what you, what you, you make them know. worried. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think that, I think there's a lot in what you say. I mean, I'm very I have a sort of maison secondaire in France and. Uh, uh, I'm very struck by when I get my tax bills. It's very it's, since devolution. It's, it's all very carefully divided into what goes to the commune, what goes to the département, what goes to the region. And uh, for those who take the trouble to read uh, these details, um, it is it is quite instructive. <coughs> yes, yes, there's another question. Can I join the discussion? Thanks. My name yes. is Emma Ten Oudste. I was wondering if I could take you up on a challenge where that there is no debate or whether there is a debate about no debate, because in my perception there is one group or one area where there is indeed a debate. And I was wondering if your observations apply to Europe or the Europeans as a whole, whether you have a special seat uh, reserved for those that are in Central and Eastern Europe. Because I think if there is a discussion in my mind <laughs> It's probably right there, because right now it's as though there's a little echo, should they join or not. Mm. Uh, the yeah. real discussions, as I perceive them right now, for them, it's an acute discussion. So my invitation to you is, would you like to elaborate on that? Oh, I agree with you. I think there is much more vital discussion. The only thing that saddens me, really, is that, I mean, I, I'm not that well informed about uh, the discussion in uh, Eastern Europe, but I have the impression that even there, a kind of economism has, uh, rather, sh has rather shaped it. And the, I'm sure that an important motive behind 
lurking in many of those discussions is you know, that having a, acquired national independence and uh, self-government, you know, why sacrifice it to in, 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 in this larger union? But my impression is that that, that level of debate, which is, would be the most interesting uh, and perhaps the most important, um, has uh, been less noticeable than uh, the debate about economic me measures, about labor migration, for instance, and, and uh, that sort of question. There is also a, a bit of a debate about con the Constitution emerging. Like you said, um, Jürgen Habermas wrote uh, uh, this, this, this essay where he asked for a Constitution. It looks like the German and the French governments are going to push ahead with it. And you, but you're saying um, that's rather the wrong moment. Well, it's not the wrong moment, but I just it's wish it were the circumstances or the background were, were different. Because it should have been done earlier. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and should we now go ahead with it? Do you agree, actually, with Habermas that we, that we need it now? Well, Habermas and I agree about the goal. Uh, he would go for it more quickly than I would, I think. Why would you, would you take more time? Because then 11 September is longer away. Well, maybe not. Not primarily that. No, because I think of this. You know, as I said, the way I see it is, you know, that you you confuse these different political cultures of European states only rather gradually. If if you're going to, in doing so, foster a, a general sense which which can make accountability real and uh, act as an effective check on centralization. Uh, and uh, I don't think that can be done, you know, simply by, by writing down things down on paper. And that's why I tried to bring out at the beginning of the book and tonight why I thought the informal cultural <laughs> preconditions of American federalism were so interesting, because it, it meant that, you know, what was on paper had this foundation uh, in habits and attitudes. Does it actually mean that because the union was started especially on these economic grounds. It was done on purpose by Schumann and the spillover effect that if you start with economics it will spill over into the rest. Does that mean that you actually question this way the union is brought about? Was it the wrong way around? No, I don't think it could have been different in the outset, but I, I suppose I think from the, from the 1980s on it could have been different. Yes, they should have they shifted should have, towards have cultural. I mean, it's, it's the dilemma of the French. <laughs> And, and it emerges in, say, uh, the, the Euro project. I mean, the, the, the political implication of the Euro project is should, certainly some form of state building. Um, on the other hand, when the French come, to, wait, when, when they're pushed about what form of state, you know, what kind of political system is Europe to have, uh, they, they draw back from federalism. I mean, they, when it's offered to them, they get rather nervous and uh, hesitate and uh, become equivocal. And, uh, and yet, at the same time, I think they know perfectly well that uh, you know, their own unitary model of the state can't be um, you know, imposed on Europe as a whole. I mean, some element, elements of it, maybe. But th that, that means, I think, you know, that, that, that helps also to explain why there hasn't been more centrally a, a, a constitutional debate. Because the French aren't sure what they'd say in that debate. No, no, no. So they don't want to start it. Yes, over there, the gentleman with the glasses. My name is uh, Dan Diedergeks. Uh, this morning I uh, stumbled on the internet on the, the article of uh, Habermas, and uh, I took it with me, and I read it this morning. <coughs> and um, in light of what you said, I want to ask one question. Uh, Habermas talks about the lack and the need of a transnational sphere of debate that's missing in Europe. I mean, we are in kind of transnational debating right now, but in a, a larger sense, isn't that a stumbling block towards, uh, towards a, a more union of the European Union? I'm not sure that. Could you, could you rephrase that question? I'm afraid it's not entirely clear what you mean. Well, the, the, there's a, the, this, there is, um, for a debate, it should be like in a national, uh, uh, in a nation state, there is a debate that is clear, there are the actors, 
but in Europe, um, the discussion stays within the nation state and is not transnational between uh, between actors in uh, uh, in the political sphere. So that the, in the sense that you should create or have a, a public opinion, a public opinion making in in a European sphere. No, I, I see what you mean. Um, Yes, well, I mean, I, that I think, you know, you can only effectively begin to create a, a European public sphere by beginning to create a European political class, which can then, you know, act as a, you know, as, as the intermediary. And uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't see that just organizing debates in a kind of some sort of international way would, would uh, do very much to foster a kind of con <coughs> constitutional sense. I think you know, con constitutional habits and attitudes, well, as I, sorry to repeat myself, you know, they're formed very slowly. Um, um, the, 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 the danger is they're lost more easily. Um, um, but Habermas also argues that if you make a constitutional, a federal constitution, then uh, that imposes the people to act as uh, well citizens who, hmm. who 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 are democratic citizens in a federal state, and then you get this culture of itself. Is that in fact the same argument you are putting forward? That it's first the federal state, and then you get uh, the habits, the political culture that uh, enables a real uh, European federal. Democracy. Should we start with the state or with the? Incident? Well, you know, there would be a lot of attraction in starting <laughs> starting with the state, with the constitution. But um, could one get agreement about the uh, content of such a constitution at the moment? I doubt it. I'm looking for the last sort of two questions, and I saw one gentleman over there. Yes, already for a long time, and there's a gentleman over here. Yes, about uh, Ari Langstad. Uh, about this question of why there is not such a debate. I was wondering whether this could be the explanation. The American states were relatively new, had not all that much history to share. The European states have been there for a long time, have a lot of history, a history of wars, of divisions, of differences. And I'm wondering whether when we really started the debate, we would not bring a, out all these differences again, and whether that would really not help the process but delay the process. And by sort of glossing over the differences, not discussing them too deeply, we are in, in fact in a better position to make progress. I would like to compare it to a marriage. Sometimes it's much better not to discuss things too deeply if you want to move forward. <laughs> and uh, so, your comments, please. Powerful point. <laughs> But um, I, w I would enter this caveat, at least. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, lies behind the, this absence of a great debate is, is, is ignorance. I mean, is historical ignorance, really. Uh, and perhaps I'm speaking too much out of the, the United Kingdom, but the, the teaching of history, and in particular what my book called you know, the history of representative government, of how representative institutions came about, and uh, has has uh, I, I think almost disappeared from uh, the, the, the history syllabus in the United Kingdom, uh, and it, it it does seem to me we've we've got into this you know, kind of constructionism that one you know that I pointed to when I talked about the fallacy of economism that because you can modify economic behavior relatively easily, that other forms uh, of behavior can also be shaped relatively easily. And I think that goes along with perhaps you know, a, a rather limited historical knowledge. Yes. Uh, my name is Gary Schwartz. I wanted to ask you about the issue which you yourself said was perhaps the most important that you addressed. And um, 
that is the danger to liberal democracy by the erosion of the shared values we have, and you spoke about the rise of secularism and permissiveness and multiculturalism as a threat to our, our value system, and spoke of a uh, grand tradition in the past in which uh, uh, there were the, 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 all of those rooms of that mansion were being occupied. Well, you and I grew up in America in the 1950s in the decade of Joseph McCarthy, of John Foster Dulles with his brinkmanship, of uh, President Eisenhower who warned us against the military industrial complex of an antagonism to intellectualism which marginalized it certainly as least as much as it, it does now. And um, there is the cult of the founding fathers, which I'm not going to uh, try to undermine, but it's also the America of Andrew Johnson and of the Civil War, of Henry Adams, who in the 1890s wrote that America was already irredeemably corrupt and materialistic, uh, the America of Upton Sinclair and of Sinclair Lewis and of Norman Mailer. And this is a country which defined itself consistently throughout this period as being more idealistic than Europe. So I wanted to ask you where you find this great tradition and why you think that today's society is uh, less, has less respect for the values of, of liberal democracy and of intellectual life. <coughs> That's a good final question. <laughs> Every democratic political system is uh, flawed. And of course, there are ebbs and flows with any, within any particular political tradition. Um, but I do think that you know, American liberalism has come up latterly against you know, certain challenges which um, you know, apart from monopoly, endemic corruption, and uh, you know more familiar challenges, are you know call into question a, a, the basic, so to speak, paradigm. And uh, you know that. Well, one one symptom of it might be, you know, the debate about um, you know Spanish and whether you know it, it's essential for. Um, you know, for the success of the political system, that everyone have a command of English. Um, that seems to me to represent uh, a rather new, a new and potentially a very, very serious problem for Ameri American federalism. Um, but even more, I, I think the claims about group rights, about alternative cultures, about respecting differences, when it's you know less than clear whether uh, the you know a framework of individual rights is being presupposed or not. Um, you know that blurring of argument in the name of inclusiveness and uh, honouring differences, respecting differences. Um, I think that I I do think that has uh, eroded the identity of American liberalism uh, to some extent in a way that you know sets the last decade or two apart from earlier American history. Good. Um, I want to thank you very much for uh, sitting here. I want to thank um, Larry Siedentop for his speech and the John Adams Institute, of course, for uh, making this all possible. But don't go away because um, there is the Chaché d'Affaires, Mr. Fendrick. Now, that, that sounds very Dutch, actually, that Fendrick. But it's the American Chaché d'Affaires who will um, close of the evening. Thank you very much. Mr. Seedenthal, Mr. Albrecht, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for this uh, extremely interesting and provocative evening. Um, I believe Mr. Seedenthal's book, A Democracy in Europe, and the discussion tonight were of great importance and necessary for all of us, and I'd like to thank Monique Knapp and, and the John Adams Institute for organizing this evening. I don't want to follow 
Mr. Seidenthal was far more an expert than I am on um, European integration and the relations with the United States, but I would like to add a few very brief observations. The U.S. has a very unique relationship with the European Union because it's the most important organization in the world to which the U.S. does not belong. The U.S. was an early and enthusiastic supporter of the European Union, European community before that, and sometimes urged integration at a speed faster than the consensus that existed among uh, member states. And we continue to support economic and political integration. In our opinion, the European Union has succeeded spectacularly in stabilizing Europe and, and ensuring its economic prosperity in the decades after the Second World War and is now the main vehicle for the reunification or the unification of Western and Central Europe following the end of, of the Cold War. A strong European Union is far preferable to the US than a weak one. A, pro a prosperous and effective European Union is a better a trading partner for the United States and better able to share responsibility on the world stage for resolving regional conflicts, obviously in Eastern and Central Europe, but further afield than that, and promoting economic development. A political scientist at Columbia University has calculated there's now more government-to-government -government communication between Washington and Brussels than between any other two cities in the world, which I think is interesting. If there's one US concern about the state of the European Union, it's that the twin processes of enlargement and institutional reform might make the European Union too introspective over the next few years at a time when the world and the US needs Europe to be more active on international issues, not less. Uh, before I have the honor to invite all of you to an informal reception following tonight's program, sponsored by the Economic Department of the City of Amsterdam and the Information Office of the European Parliament in The Hague, I'd like to bring to your attention some programs which the John Adams Institute has in store for us in the, few, in the next few months. Oliver Sachs, the well-known neuropsychiatrist, will speak about his first autobiographical book, Uncle Tungsten, My Chemical Boyhood, on January, on December 10th, and the moderator for that evening will be Ronald Pla uh, Plasterk. On December 13th, th uh, three days later, the well-known linguist Deborah Tannen will discuss her new book, I Only Say This Because I Love You, which I guess follows your uh, point about uh, political effects of marriage. <laughs> and she will be interviewed by former American ambassador here to the Netherlands, Cynthia Schneider. They're both affiliated with Georgetown University in Washington, where both are professors. I am told that after hearing Deborah Tanner, you will never communicate with anybody the way you used to. So it should be interesting. And on January 10th, the John Adams Institute, which is always tries to bring in the most uh, up-to-date and current writers, thinkers, will bring Jonathan Franson, who wrote the best-selling novel, The Corrections, which is already available in Dutch in all the bookstores. And he will be interviewed by literary guru, guru Michael, Mikhail Zeman. Thank you again very much for being here, and I wish you all a good evening. Enjoy the reception. Thanks very much.